I'd like to first of all introduce one of my fellow Observer Awards judges, um, Stacey Dooley, who has been working um, tirelessly. She's just come back from America and is about to go off to Greece, looking at injustices in the world. Um, I don't know how many of you know about her involvement in blood, sweat, and T-shirts, but for us, as an educator, that had a, a, an incredible impact on our, on our students across the college where they were thinking about what it was to be a designer, to be working in an industry where all the sorts of things that were being uncovered were things that affect us all. So please join me in welcoming Stacey Dooley. These are my notes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You ready? These are just notes, loose notes. I feel a bit like Britney Spears in this, so I promise I won't break into the time. I'm going to turn it over. You ready? Okay, go. Ah. Okie dokie. Um, hi, you're all well. Nice to be here. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking Five Times Fifteen for inviting me here this evening. Really appreciate it. It's always nice to speak alongside fellow guests. Um, you're always told that you should never Google their achievements and their accolades because it can be a bit daunting, but I've obviously completely ignored that advice and I think you're all awesome. Lucy, you're my girl. I've got your book in, in my toilet. <laughs> it's not near the toilet, it's near the bath. It's the ambiance. Uh, anyway, I'm Stacey Dooley and I'm a documentary maker. So essentially what I try and do is make loosely current affairs -y issues based documentaries, but we try and focus on making them very accessible and very personable and make sure that the human element um, is at the forefront of the docs. I think sometimes they can be a bit stiff or a bit highbrow or a bit inaccessible, and as a result, you, you don't really watch them. Um, so I started nine years ago now. Um, and it's been quite varied, so I look at things from cocaine production in Peru to um, sort of levels of brutality against women in Honduras, paedophilia in the Philippines, homelessness in Detroit, transgender equality. So it's quite a varied um, set of topics, but uh, the way I came into this industry and the way my career started was actually a very organic process. Um, so there was a production company that were based in Brighton, where we're now living, not together, separately. Um, and they were after, they were looking for six contributors to take part in their new series that had just been commissioned by BBC Three. And it was fairly straightforward. They were just looking for six British consumers who were really obsessed with this throwaway fashion, this fast consumerism, and people who had bought into it, knowingly or, or unknowingly. Um, so it all seemed <laughs> very straightforward. And I was working at Luton Airport at the time, selling perfume, as all the highbrow papers will um, remind you when they give me a write-up. And, um, you know, I used to work really hard all week, save up all my wages. So I've just turned 19. And then I'd go down to the Arndale at the end of the week with all of this money and buy as much as I could, you know, as many clothes as possible, um, with no real thought, no real respect um, about what I was buying or who had made it. It's just something that had never entered my mind. And I remember <laughs> I was the worst. I really was. Like, we were all going on a girl's holiday because we all worked at Luton Airport. We got cheap flights to Spain. Um, <laughs> and we went down the Arndale with the trail of thought. We were of the mentality that we're just going to buy as many cheap bikinis as we possibly can and as many vests, and we'll just get loads, and then they'll get trashed, and then we'll throw them away. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah, great idea, great idea. And um, I bought this, this bikini, <laughs> and it was kind of peach and green, and I really thought I was the shit, not like, really happening, and it was about three quid. And um, I remember calling it my if only because it looked so much like Miss Sony. It was like all the zigzag patterns. And you know, it was at the time when it actually felt quite fashionable to be wearing cheaper alternatives. I remember like going through the daily mags or the weekly editorials, and you'd always have like a celeb championing that you know, she would always go down to the high street and even though she still had all this money, she still went for the high street and we would think that was great because she was still one of us. 
And it also meant that we could go down to Primark and also buy the exact same piece that Colleen Rooney was wearing a couple of days ago. Um, so it, it really was part of our culture, certainly for me when, when I was growing up. Um, let me just have a quick nose, my video. So yeah, it, it really felt like, you know, that this was our life. Anyway, going back to the TV series. Um, so I rang the researcher. Hello, I'm Stacey. Hi, how's things? And now I know how television works. They must have just been rubbing their hands in glee when they heard me down that line, because I was exactly what they were looking for. I was ignorant. I had no, no idea that it was a global industry. You know, not because I didn't care or I was a nightmare. I, it just had never entered my mind. Um, and she was saying, you know, it's going to be very immersive and you will have to live exactly how the Indian workers live. We'll take you there for a month. We're looking to film for 57 minutes, so it's a long time. Yeah, 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 cool, cool, cool. Um, she said, but you mustn't be gutted if you don't get selected because thousands of girls are going for it. I'll get it. Anyway, <laughs> month later, I met Heathrow with the suitcase, and I'm thinking, yeah. Um, but they weren't missing. Like, it really was the real deal. As soon as we got off that flight, we were taken to a local family's home, and it was more of a mud hut than it was, you know, a stone house. And I'd never left Europe. You know, I'd been going to Spain on EasyJet um, and felt very cultured doing that. But so India really was so overwhelming, you know, the smell, the colours, and, you know, I was like, where's their kitchen? And she was like, oh, well, this is the fire that we've made and we cook our chapatis here and where's the toilet? I'm after a wee. Oh, there's no toilet, but there's this hole in the ground. And I just remember thinking, I'm here for a week? Like, surely when the cameras stop rolling, they'll take us to the hotel. <laughs> nah, man, like, that night, I was, like, fighting with a mozzie net, and it was all going tits up, and I was sleeping on this sleeping bag. Anyway, the next day, I get up, do my teeth with bottled water, because there's no sink, and I go to work with the father of the family, and it takes us two hours to walk to his factory, his garment factory, and he walks over train tracks just to get there. And I was on a live production line. So I was making blazes, I think it was for H&M. Um, and I was so shit, I kept fucking up the sleeves and then the other girls had to keep mending my work and it was hot, I worked 10 hours. And I think I earned less than a fiver for sure. It was something like three quid or something ridiculous. And I just remember thinking, this is gonna be a really long <laughs> month. And I'm gonna show you a quick clip. This was one of the factories that they were happy to show us. They were happy for us to film in here because they thought this was the best, the most elite. So it gives you an indication of the levels and, and um, yeah, what they're used to because some of the more harsher conditions, they wouldn't let us bring a camera in. But this, this was <laughs> my first dose of, of garment making. Please, I'm so sorry about my fringe. It's really cringe. There's one toilet shed by up to 30 workers, and the canteen, that's a gas burner. This will be their place of work until they finish the job. This is how I imagined a sweatshop to be. Um, just dirty, smelly, disgusting. It's just absolutely horrible. It's really bad. We haven't got any toilets. We've got no toilet roll. We haven't got even a shower. <laughs> it's dirty and it smells really bad. Just a bit depressing, really, like with the smell of the generator and just everything really kind of like intoxicating and really like. Yeah, this place is my idea of hell. Uh, 
There I am in all my glory. And you know, I totally forgot that the camera, like everyone says it, but you forget that the cameras are running because I had really bad skin because we hadn't washed in so long. And I've got pseudocreme all over my face, talking to the telly. And then I watched it back, I'm like, ugh. Um, but that was one of the easiest factories to work in and one of the best, to be honest with you. After Delhi, uh, we flew down to the border of Pakistan to pick cotton for the cotton that's used. To, to make the garments, and again, just mad hot, ridiculously warm, sort of late 30s, early 40s in, in terms of degrees, and you know, it was, it was much more physically demanding, because we didn't have any shade, and we had these huge sacks on our backs, and we'd have to pick the cotton and throw it in the, the bags as we went. But unbelievably, most of the women that I was working alongside um, were really heavily pregnant, because they were, you know, deems not good enough for, for the factory floor because that requires a bit more skill. So some of them were collapsing. Like, it, it, it really was, um, really was quite intense. And I remember saying, how much have you earned today? And it being the equivalent of something like 150. And me being, uh, like, are you, are you going to be able to feed your kids off the back of that shift? No, no, no. Like, I'll have to put that with my husband's money and my sister's money, and then we'll be able to buy some food. Um, so, so that's when it started getting quite tricky for me, like it was, it was quite emotional. Um, and then after we left there, we, f we flew down to Mumbai. And for me, without question, last two weeks, the last fortnight, were the hardest by a mile. Um, there's an area in Mumbai called Dharavi, which I don't know if you've heard of. It's like where they film Slumdog Millionaire. So it's not more gentrified now. They've poured more money into it. But at the time, it was the biggest dump, uh, the biggest dump, the biggest slum in Asia. <laughs> I can't say that. Sorry. It was the biggest slum in Asia. Um, and the sweatshops there were just on a whole nother level. You know, sometimes there would be four or five built one on top of the other and we were having to crawl in over a waste dump to, to get in there. And you couldn't stand straight because the ceilings were so low, so you'd have to crawl on your hands and knees. And there were people sleeping under their own sewing machines, and it just immediately felt so, so grim. And because we were on a waste dump, you know, the, the smell, you had this sort of constant nausea, like, like you were going to throw up at any moment. And, I remember looking in the corner and there was a load of kids. And it was the first time I'd stumbled across child labour, you know? And they, they were focused on sort of more of the intricate details because, you know, their hands are so tiny. They're easy with the fiddlier stuff. It's two minutes. Oh, um, it's a lot more, you know, it's easier for them. So I just want to show you a quick clip um, of this young lad. Um, his folks had sent him to earn some money so that he could feed his family. Is it working? Oh. oh, thank you. Thank you. Having been on a raid yesterday to find children working in factories, Mark, Amrita, Georgina and Stacy want to find out how children end up as child labourers. They're visiting a school set up by a local charity to meet some of the kids who have been rescued. Yeah. They seem like really, really young here. What, what's the average age? They, um, mostly the children from uh, 9 to 12. The, okay. 13, 14. It's not long, is it? Yeah. <laughs> as well as having a place to study, the children also live and sleep here. These, these all your things? These all your belongings? Yeah? He's got, he's got, this is where he just keeps all his drawings and his crayons and his wash bag, and his clothes, all his bits. Stacy wants to know how these kids ended up as labourers. If you don't mind, Mohammed, where's your mum where's your mum and your dad? Where's your family? <laughs> Your mum and your dad, did they send you to the slum to work? Did they tell you to go? My family told me to go to Bombay. 
बम्बे में जारी का काम करना पर इतना इतना पैसा मिलेगा इसलिए मेरे माँ बाप ने बोला जा मैं आ गया जाऊँ I'm going to stop that there because I know I'm running out of time. But Blood Sweat, which was the series, um, rated consistently well. Um, it was nominated for BAFTA, which was brilliant because it meant our targeted demographic really did care. You know, there was this appetite to know who was making our clothes. And um, when I came home, I was sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place because I wanted to do my bit. You know, I wanted to shop ethically given what I'd seen. But also, I didn't want to look like I'd been travelling for two years and I was sort of finding myself in Southeast Asia and like all that hemp business. I just I thought, oh, I can't do that. So, but that was nine years ago. Um, and I do think that things have improved and I do think we have come a long way. But I do still think there's a huge amount to do. And as consumers, we are, without question, the most powerful players in the fashion game. So if you keep hassling and if you keep consistently telling your favourite shops and your favourite fashion, labels that this is a huge deal to you. They'll have no choice but to listen to you because they don't want you to go elsewhere. So that is my tiny bit of advice for you all. Um, thanks ever so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you.